pyramids, like the pyramids of Egypt all over the world. Who built them and why? I suspect many of those were built before the flood. And if not, then the technology from before the flood, assuming that it was all destroyed, then uh, was built after the flood in that period of time between about oh, 2350 B.C. and about, oh, maybe no, 1400-1500 B.C., maybe a thousand-year period. Now, there's a lot of questions that you probably have in your mind that are answered in other chapters in the book. Always keep in mind that when I review a book, I cannot read the whole thing to you. You know, I can't cover every page, every subject, every topic, every chapter. So I pick out of the book those chapters that are really uh, uh, boggled the mind. Now, there's one in here that deals with uh, uh, electricity. Have I got electric in here? Where is it? Geography, astronomy, cosmology, mathematics, metallurgy, large-scale construction, construction techniques, engineering, mechanical devices, everyday items. There's a chapter in here that deals with uh, electricity, and I can't put my finger on it. So I'm not going to spend the time looking for it right now. Uh, How about uh, microscopes? Microscope. Did Moses have a microscope? Now, we know that uh, Galileo discovered the telescope, you know, sometime in the 1500s. And then from that, somebody got smart and they said, well, if we can see out to the moon, can we see something a little bit smaller? And then we, we polished glass. And then we made the glass convex and concave. And as time progressed, we finally came up with microscopes. Well, listen to this story. It's chapter 15. Glasswork. Microscope on a sexy spider. Leaping lizards. What do you make of that? Shall we bank for another run? The Peruvian flyers could scarcely believe their eyes. Spread out below all over the desolate Nazca Plateau was a mass of geometric patterns and giant pictures of birds, animals, and people as far as the eye could see. These ground-drawn objects were so numerous that they could be seen only from an airplane. Small wonder that they were not discovered until that day in 1939. Now here are some some really fabled, and you've probably heard this Naz, what do they call this thing now? Nazca, N-A-Z-C-A. I imagine if you put that into a Google search, you probably get a lot of information, Naz, Nazca. Anyway, for those of you that are uninitiated, down here in Peru, up around 15,000 feet, there's a flat plateau. And on this plateau is a spider. This spider is six miles across. It's built about 18 inches high out of, out of just little rocks. Somebody went out here, and they, they just picked up little rocks, and they built a stone wall 18 inches high. And they built it in the outline of a spider. And the thing is six miles across. Six miles. And it's in perfect, in perfect size. I mean, the legs are the perfect size with the head, and the head's perfect sized with the body and it's got all eight legs and they all stick out in one thing there's monkeys and other animals and there's people and there's six eight miles across the only way you can see when you're on the ground and you're walking along what you see is a stone wall and so you walk along and you say gee here's a little stone wall 18 inches it won't keep a sheep in it won't keep a llama in it won't keep a cow in and it's about 18 inches high and it's uniform in height and it goes out there for a long long ways I mean you can look down this wall and it curves you know, and it's and it's, but you can't see what it is. You could not tell that that was a spider by looking at this walking on the ground. But in 1939, some guy's flying over it with an airplane, taking pictures, and he says, "Oh my God, there's a great big spider down there, and it's six miles across." Well, then they went down there and they started measuring this thing. Who built that? And who built the monkey? And who built the the people? You know, the the outlines of these people in these 18 inch stone walls. That's who built it. And then the question is, why? Why would anybody do such a thing? Because you couldn't appreciate it. You, you couldn't even know it was there unless you were in an airplane flying over it. You have to be in an airplane. you got to be up in the air over the top of it to see what the hell it is. That's how big it is. Now, that tells you pretty plainly that whoever built that thing built that to be looked at, and the people that are going to look at it are going to look at it from an airplane or from up in the air. could be a gas balloon. I mean, you know. But then if that's the case, then gas balloons were invented before 1700. first one I heard of was a hot air balloon flown in France about you know 1705 or something like that. 
But it gets better than that. Not only do we need an airplane to see this, fashioned by an unknown pre-Inca culture and covering an area of 30 square miles, they're still unexplained. So here's 30 square miles of plateau with a number of these monuments, these monkeys, spiders, and people laid out on the ground in 18-inch high uh, little rock walls. We have no idea, working from the ground, anybody could execute such figures in perfect proportion. They can be observed successfully only from 1,000 feet in the air. One of the drawings depicts a spider. It has one leg deliberately lengthened and extended, and at the tip of the leg, there is a small cleared area. Now, there's only one spider known who uses the tip of its third leg in this precise manner shown in the drawing in this six mile long rock wall spider it's called the Rickinulee it's spelled R-I-C-I-N-U-L-E-I Rickinulee that's the way I'm pronouncing it it inhabits caves deep in the Amazon jungle this spider is recognized by scientists for its unique method of copulation for which it uses that extended leg in the described manner that's in this spider at Nazca Plateau in Peru. It is an extremely rare species of spider. Now, for the incredible part. This spider's mode of reproduction can be only observed by the aid of a microscope. Boys and girls, let's stop and think about this for a minute. Up here on top of this plateau is this huge spider, six miles across. You can't even see that this is a spider unless you're up in an airplane at least a 1,000 feet in the air. So you can look down on it and see six miles across. This spider is in perfect proportion. It's built out of rock. It's not big rocks now, just little ordinary rocks. You can just pick them up and stack them in a rock wall. And the spider now, from the tip of one side of it to the tip of the other side, is six miles across. And then from the other side to the other side, it's about four miles across. It's it's wider than it is, uh, it's it's longer than it is wide. So it's four by six miles. You've got to be in an airplane to see it. The third leg is extended in a way that only this rare spider extends its leg. This leg is used in copulation, in reproduction. And the only way that you can see the way the spider reproduces with this leg is with a microscope. What's that tell you? It tells you that the guy that built the spider up there had to have a microscope to observe the spider so that he would know that the spider reproduces with this third leg. Then when it's reproduced, it's done by a spider being built in stone walls in perfect proportions, four by six miles. Now, boys and girls, that's a... That's quite a story. So the question is, how were these artists able to find and then observe their tiny model unless we can see that they inherited a knowledge of science equaling our own, including the use of the ground optical lens in a microscope? Turning, therefore, to glasswork, we find ourselves treated to more surprises from the ancient world. And yet nothing is incredible any longer. The word impossible should have become literally impossible for us. China, before 2500 B.C., Assyria, 2700 B.C., and Medzamer, Armenia, 2500 B.C., the making of glass was well known. In Haifa, or Haifa, Israel, a glass block weighing 88 tons. There are only two masses of glass that are larger than this 88 tons, and both are the casts for the huge mirrors of the Mount Palomar telescopes. Got this? Ancient times. 88-ton piece of glass. It's sitting in Haifa, Israel. Now, we're told, of course, that ancient man was backward. I hope my curiosity will be pardoned. I have a question. How did those early races develop the enormous amount of heat necessary to melt the ingredients into this enormous mass of glass? Well, obviously, this block is inexplicable, except with reference to a super technology. Now, I want to point out that when you got a piece of glass 88 tons in size, Boys and girls, those Mount Palomar telescopes, that telescope of that 200-inch up there, it's bigger. It weighs more than that 88 tons. Now go back, do a Google search on Mount Palomar. 
They built the thing back in the 1930s. And when you read the story of how that polymer telescope was built, it'll just boggle your mind. And here, here is a story. Back in ancient times, they got a block of rock that they call glass. It's 88 tons in size. Huh? Boy, you got to have real technology. That, was, that, that polymer telescope was designed and built by the Corning Glass Works in New York. They were the only people in the world that could cast a piece of glass that big, and that was back in the 1930s. Then the thing had to be shipped on railroad cars, special railroad cars, out to California. Then they had to move it from the railroad cars in Los Angeles up to the top of this mountain. I mean, it's a story that just that just uh, boggles your mind. It was a hell of a feat back in the 1930s. And here we got the same thing going on thousands of years ago. But they didn't have railroads, and they didn't have trucks, they didn't have gas engines, they didn't have furnaces. Way back there, they were dragging their knuckles on the ground, hitting their old lady over the head and dragging her off by the hair. That's what we're told in school. Ah, come on.